Okay, welcome everyone to this evening's presentation, Health Literacy and Assessing Health Information. Um, tonight's presentation is brought to you by the AHIMA Foundation. Um, just so you know, um, this evening's record this evening's presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to pass the mic on to Megan. Okay, Megan. Thanks, Irene. I'm Megan McVeigh. I'm the Director of Impact Programs here at the AHIMA Foundation. We're very excited that Irene invited us to present to you guys today about health information and accessing health information. Quickly, before we jump in, just wanted to give you an overview of the HEMA Foundation. <clears throat> the HEMA Foundation is a nonprofit foundation which works to empower people to become engaged and activated participants in their health and wellness journey using trusted health information. We are based out of Chicago, so happy to per be presenting to a local at home audience tonight. Um, the foundation is affiliated with AHIMA, which is the American Healthcare Information Management Association. <clears throat> Healthcare information management is the practice of acquiring, analyzing, and protecting digital and traditional medical information vital to providing quality patient care. It is a combination of business, science, and information technology. Tonight's presentation is going to be conducted by Dr. Leah Graebner. Um, we are excited to have Leah here. She holds a PhD in health services with a concentration in communication community health promotion and education from Walden University. She has over 30 years of experience in the health information management career field. She is a registered health information administrator and a certified coding specialist. Most importantly though, and why Leah is here today to present to you is that she's passionate about consumer engagement in health information management and provision of community education about personal health records. So she is the perfect ally and the perfect person to talk with today about health information. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Leah. The Irene is gonna be monitoring the chat. So if you guys have any real-time questions or comments, feel free to pop it in there. Um, and we do have time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have any questions for Leah, she'd be happy to answer those. Leah, take it away. Okay. So first we're gonna start off with talking about getting a basic understanding of what health literacy is and what health information is. Next slide. So health literacy actually currently has two definitions that came from Healthy, Healthy People 2030. The first definition is that personal health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. The second half of the definition we have is organizational health literacy, and that's the degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. Now, these definitions are a change from the health literacy definition that was used in Health Be Healthy People 2010 and Healthy People 2020. That definition was the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. So these new definitions emphasize people's ability to use health information rather than just understand it. And it focuses on the ability to make well-informed decisions rather than just making an appropriate decision. It incorporates a public health perspective and acknowledges the fact that organizations have a responsibility to address health literacy. Next slide. So next we're going to look at what health information is. And this definition comes from the American Health Information Management Association. Health information is the data related to a person's me medical history, including symptoms, diagnoses, procedures, and outcomes. When we're looking at a health record, we're looking at your health history, lab results, radiology, clinical information, demographic information, and any kind of notes that come from the healthcare provider. Go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So we've got some questions, and if you want to put your answers in the chat to the for these. First question is, do you feel confident finding your health information? And Megan or, or Irene, if you want to let me know what's in the chat. Yeah, Irene, if you can uh, keep an eye on the chat, that would be great. And if anyone wants to speak, is there a yes. raise your hand function or feel free to unmute? Um, if anyone wants to speak, they can unmute themselves. Um, Diane says she's pretty confident. Okay. And River Edge Hospital said yes. Okay. Do you feel that your information that you get is easy to understand? For the most part. Who okay. helps you with your health information? Who helps you understand it? Who helps you get your information? Um, I'll, I'm telling you, I can't think of the name of the, it comes through the hospital system, University of Chicago hospital system. Um, and I think they do a marvelous job of, of, of keeping me abreast of the health information from the interaction I've had with the hospital, whether it be physicals or, or prescriptions, um, I can find that information. Okay, go ahead and go on to the next slide. Now this next part of the presentation, we're going to talk about accessing your health information. So go to, go to the next slide. And we've got some questions to ask your healthcare provider. First, it's important to know what a patient portal is. Um, patient portal is a means of accessing your personal health information. It may be a website login or even an app on your phone. Uh, a lot of providers in, I'm in central Illinois and Peoria, and a lot of the providers here use Epic electronic health records and have a MyChart application. Um, I'm not sure, do you guys have MyChart up in your area? Okay, um, my chart is available both online and on using a phone app, but there's other portals out there as well. A patient portal can provide you access to various parts of your health records, such as visit summaries, medication lists, your immunization history, allergies, test results, including labs and x-rays. And a patient portal can be accessed any time of day. So you can access your information outside of your provider's office hours if necessary. And many patient portals also provide an option to send a non-urgent message to your healthcare provider. So uh, one of the questions you can ask your healthcare provider is, could you please let me know how I can see my health information online? And do you have a patient portal? Next, what if I have questions or problems? How can I get help? You wanna find out who to contact for, for support if you need help accessing your health information. For example, do you just call your provider's office or do they have a special number or email for support? And what can I do to keep my health information safe? Keeping your health information safe should be your number one priority. You can ask your healthcare provider what they do to keep your information safe, but you should also be prepared to safeguard your information. If you maintain a personal health record or any kind of copies of your health information, there's a lot of worry about medical identity theft, which is a lot more difficult to recover from than financial identity theft. Because once somebody gets their name on your health information, HIPAA protects their information as well. And so you all of a sudden have lost access to your health records. So that's something to be concerned about. If I'm taking care of a loved one, can I get access to their portal? So if you're taking care of a loved one, it's important to realize that you may experience some potential obstacles to accessing their health information. You need to have documentation that designates that you're a power of attorney for health care or you know, that you're a parent or guardian. If you don't have this, you may not be able to access their information. Next slide, please. So we've got some questions here about personal health records. First of all, 
what is a personal health record or a PHR as we refer to it? It's a collection of records owned and managed by an individual patient used to track and make decisions about health care. So why should you have a personal health record? Going back to our definition of health literacy, the PHR helps keep you informed of your health status and provides a means for basing your healthcare decisions and communication with healthcare providers. So who should have a personal health record? I have a one word answer to that, everybody. You should have one for your child starting with birth and immunization records. If you have college age kids, send them off with a copy of their personal health record and be sure to include family history in that. Um, I, have, I have kids that are just past college age. And so they're at that age where they're going to the doctor by themselves now and having to fill out health histories. And they don't know any of this information because it's never been a priority for them. So I give them a form that has it written out for them. So they've got family history as well as their own personal health history, their immunization records and so on. Um, one of the things that I've done for friends of mine is make a cute little decorated binder with a personal health record form in it, makes a great wedding gift add on for a new couple or something for, you know, if you go to a baby shower, you know, have, give them a, a child form in a nice little binder so that they can start keeping track of their child's health history from birth. So what we're going to include in a PHR, I'm gonna do on the next slide and how to obtain the records we're going to follow, follow with that. So go to the next slide, please. So what do you wanna include in your personal health record? Patient demographics, that's your contact information, you know, your name, your address, your phone number, uh, insurance information. You wanna have emergency contact information. And along with that, you wanna make sure you have address and phone number for that emergency contact. Physician contact information. This isn't just your primary care physician. This is every physician that, you, that has records for you. Every physician that you've had any kind of contact with along the way through your healthcare journey throughout your life. Um, insurance information. Advanced directives. That would be a living will, a, your power of attorney for health care, do not resuscitate, those type of things are considered advanced directives. Organ donation information, medication list. Now, this is one of those things that you want to make sure that you update every time you have a change to any medications, whether it's a change in dosage, a change in how often you take it, or addition or deletion of a medication. You want to have a list of significant illnesses and surgical procedures. And one of the things that I recommend to have with that is the date that you got a certain diagnosis and the date of surgical procedure, along with who the surgeon was for that surgical procedure and possibly where the hospital was or other facility where you had that surgical procedure performed at. You also want, I'm not quite ready yet. You also want to include family history. Um, family history is very important. And a lot of times when you're going to a new healthcare provider and they're asking about family history, they may ask, is the person still alive? How old were they when they died? How old were they when they got certain diagnoses such as a cancer diagnosis or a heart, heart failure diagnosis or something like that? And one thing that I like to remind people is don't forget your dental history and your eye doctor history. Those are two things that a lot of times people send, tend to neglect when they're putting together their personal health records because they don't think about that as health information. Okay, now I'm ready for the next slide. Okay, so patient portals only provide a limited summary of your health information. So sometimes it might be necessary for you to request additional information or more detailed information. Besides accessing your health information electronically, you can also request your personal health information in writing. So HIPAA specifies required elements of a valid authorization to request health information. This includes 
a description of exactly what information is to be disclosed. And that includes things like dates of service that you want your information for. You have to provide the name of the individual authorized to make the disclosure, the name of the recipient of the information. And you know, again, this, is, this could be yourself, this could be you're releasing it to somebody else. A description of the purpose of disclosure. So for you know, personal health record, it would just be self-use. An expiration date or event for the authorization. So you have to say, how long is this authorization, authorization good for? You have to have a signature of their individual or the personal representative, such as a power of attorney for healthcare. And the source of this information comes from the US Department of Health and Human Services. They've got a great website that has a lot of information about HIPAA. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. In the state of Illinois, this information on this slide came from the Illinois Health Information Management Association. Um, if you want to find it online, it's www.ilhima.org. And when you get copies of your health records, you may have to pay to get copies of the records. And this shows an example of what the, the handling fees are that can be charged in the state of Illinois. Also provides a little bit of information about, you know, besides the expenses, how you can get your information in what format. So the person requesting copies of records shall reimburse the facility or healthcare practitioner for what they refer to as reasonable expenses, including the cost of an independent copy service company that's incurred in connection with such copying not to exceed a handling charge for processing the request, any postage or shipping, and any copy charges. A lot of healthcare facilities use copy services to take care of the release of information. The facility or healthcare practitioner may, however, charge for the reasonable cost of all duplication of record material or information that cannot be routinely copied or duplicated on standard commercial photocopy machine, and that could be something like x-ray films. Records retrieved from scanning, digital imaging, electronic information, or other digital format do not qualify as microfiche or microfilm for retrieval purposes when you're calculating charges. So on that last line up there, which says copies made from microfiche or microfilm, that's not included. For electronic records received from a scanning digital imaging, electronic information, or other digital format in electronic document, a charge of 50% of the per page, per page charge for paper copies listed above. So this per page charge includes the cost of a CD-ROM, a DVD, or other storage media that may be used. Records already maintained in electronic or digital format shall be provided in electronic format when it's requested. So if you want a copy of your records on a CD or a DVD, you can request that. Going ahead to the next slide. So it's important to know what your rights are that have to do with health information. You have the right to look at your health information and or get a paper or electronic copy of this. And this right is protected by federal law. So this isn't just in the state of Illinois, this is a federal regulation. You have the right to accurate and complete health information. This is necessary in order to coordinate care among providers and maintain patient safety. You wanna make sure when you're getting information sent to your healthcare provider, or if you're getting a copy of your records to give to, give to the healthcare provider, that they've got the full picture of your health history. And you know, again, to maintain patient safety, they need to know, do you have any allergies? They need to know what your, your whole medication list is. Uh, they need to know if you have any health conditions that something is contraindicated for. You have the right to ask for ch changes to your health information. So if you find something in your health record that you think is incorrect or incomplete, federal law, HIPAA, allows you to notify the provider and request a change. And your request will become a permanent part of your health record. 
You have the right to know how your health information is used or shared and who has received it. Now, HIPAA also requires that the provider provides you with a notice of privacy practices. So you've probably seen that when you've gone to a healthcare provider where they ask you to sign off that they've, that they've offered you a copy of their notice of privacy practices. And along with that, you have the right to request a list of those who have received your information, excluding that used for treatment payment or operations. So what that means is you can ask who's, got, who, who's received a copy of my health information. And when I talk about treatment payment and operations, you can't ask for you know, what doctors have, rec have received it for you know, treatment purposes. You can't ask for operational purposes, you know, which employees have access to your record because that's covered under treatment payment and operations. And then your insurance company, you know, they, that's considered payment purposes. Uh, you have the right to ask for limitations on the use and release of your health information. Now, this does not apply for emergency treatment. Also, if you don't allow your insurance company to get information, you will be required to pay out of pocket for your care. So that's something you need to be aware of if you want to put a limitation on that. You have the right to expect your health information to be private and secure. And again, this is protected under HIPAA. You have the right to be informed about privacy and security breaches to your health information. Uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has a lot of good information out there on their website about privacy and security breaches and notifications of the public about, you know, if there's a mass breach that happens. Um, they have different levels of notification for depending on what type of breach it is, how, you know, how big of a breach it is. You know, if it's less than 500 people, they do one thing. If it's more than 500 people, then they have to notify the media. And finally, you have the right to file a complaint or report a violation regarding your health information within the organization and with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, next slide. Okay, so where do you look for trusted health information? You know, when I talked about if you understand your information and where, you know, where do you get help for? Let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. We've got a listing here of some reputable websites. WebMD is a good one. Medline Plus is a good one. National Institute of Health. Mayo Clinic has a great website. Drugs.com. Um, in general, I always tell people, look for something that's a .gov, a .edu, or a .org, and stay away from .coms. But drugs.com is a really good site. Um, I teach a pharmacology class and I have my students use this site. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, familydoctor.org, and the Medical Library Association. Now, Irene, I think you had something you wanted to add on this slide. Um, just to reiterate what you said, these are pretty much uh, reputable health-related websites. Uh, most of them are federal, um, Netline Plus, the difference, difference between Metline Plus and WebMD is Metline Plus does not have ads. So you can pretty much scroll through the majority of this website and access the drug portal, uh, surgery videos, things like that. Um, so then I just want to say, ask the health and wellness librarian if you need more information on a lot of these trusted resources, you can contact me uh, in the library. I can leave my contact information in the chat box. And another thing that I want to add also, don't be afraid to ask your doctor questions or your, your healthcare provider questions. You know, you can ask questions through the patient portal. You can call their office and ask questions. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. I think we're ready for questions at this point. Yes. I'm going to stop gonna... sharing my screen so that we can open it to questions. And if you want to pop up on camera, you're more than welcome to. Hi there. Can Hi. you? Hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is about 
what happens if you move from one medical group to another, maybe because of insurance reasons or you're changing providers? I worry a little bit about moving somewhere else because then um, everything that's on the portal with the provider that I have now, I either have to figure out how to get, and it sounds actually like a kind of could be an expensive process, <laughs> um, but how else do you get your records from one provider to another medical group? Okay, you've actually got a couple of really good questions there. First, I want to address the expense. If it's for continuation of care, most providers will give you the records for free. Mm -hmm. So if it's for self-use, they may charge you for it. But if it's for continuation of care to go to another provider, generally that's free. Um, to get, get your records transferred from one physician to another physician is really not that difficult. They have you fill out a, a, a HIPAA form that says, you know, where your records are going to. The six elements that I showed you that are, that are required for the HIPAA authorization for release of information, you'll just have to fill that out and they will generally transfer that records from one, for, to your new physician. That sounds pretty straightforward. But if you're moving your whole family, right, it, then you've got you have to, to fill out one for each person. One for each person, and then they would they would move those over. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Any other questions? While we wait for more questions, Megan, you can talk about the information you put in the chat box. Yeah, so I posted a link for the, uh, a link that lists all those websites Leah was talking about. So WebMD, Medline Plus, um, if you go to that website, you can then just click to those different resources. I'm also gonna put in a, so th these are HEMA Foundation resources. So we also have a general web page that I'm gonna put in where you can find information um, about patient portals, more information about knowing your rights, information on finding good health info. So I'll put that in there too. Um, and Megan, then- do you just, also wanna include hhs.gov, the Department yeah, of Yeah, I can put services. that in there, yep. Um, Leah, I know HIPAA is like a big hot button topic. Can mm -hmm. you give a quick overview of like what HIPAA is and how it protects consumers, but how it also strives to make information easy for healthcare providers to get and use? Sure. Um, when we talk about HIPAA, most people think that it just has to do with privacy and security. That's really just a tiny little part of HIPAA. Uh, one of the biggest things that we have with HIPAA is making sure that the health information is portable. And so that means that we can get information transferred from one provider to another. And there's a big part of HIPAA that has to do with electronic communication of health information. So that would include your patient portals, but it also includes things like transferring that information electronically from one provider to another provider, transferring information from the provider to the insurance company or to Medicare or to Medicaid. Um, I'm trying to think what else, you know, how to consolidate HIPAA into just a, you know, um, it also talks about the code sets that are used. So when you have your billing that happens, the code set that's used is defined by HIPAA. So it's telling us that we have to use these certain code sets to make sure that everybody's doing things consistently and we're not just making things up along the way. We wanna make sure that everybody's reporting the same things consistently. Does anybody have any questions about HIPAA? I am interested in the coding part of it because I know that when I get my EOBs, those explanations of benefits, there will be codes on there. And I just sort of think of that as a foreign language that I don't speak. <laughs> but is it the case that there are resources that I can go to? Not that I want to be um, a medical professional, but to understand a little bit better 
what those are and how the insurance company reads them and figures out how they'll be covered. The ICD 10 CM codes are actually in public domain and you can access them on the CDC website. So if you look up ICD to ICD 10 CM, you can get a list of the codes. It's a very, very large PDF file. So it's not something you want to print out, but it is something that you can access through there. Um, you can always call your physician and say, you know, I see that this was coded with this number. Can you tell me what this is? And they should be able to tell you that as well. The other type of codes you're going to see is CPT codes. And those are your procedure codes. It stands for current procedural terminology. And um, those, on, those codes, unfortunately, are not in the public domain. Those are copyrighted by the American Medical Association. But again, if you want to know what a CPT code stands for, call your healthcare provider and just ask them, what does this code stand for? And one of the things that unfortunately happens now is, you know, the insurance company will deny something because of how it's coded, and they'll put it back on the patient to contact their provider to ask them to have something coded differently, which puts the patient in an awkward situation because patients don't understand codes. You know, I've got students that go through a two-year degree program to learn how to do coding. And so they can't expect the patient to understand, you know, what, how the codes are used and what the codes are for and so on. So, but yeah, if you want to see the ICD-10 CM codes, you can just go to cdc.gov. All right, then. And I guess another question, I do have a child that I'm getting ready to send off to college. So uh -huh. um, in addition to sort of that family history and their personal health record, other thoughts about what else they might need when they get specifically out of state to a different place and are trying to figure out how to get health care out there. One of the things that you might want to do is suggest to your, suggest to your adult child that they put, you know, when, when they go to a new health care provider, they'll have them fill out a HIPAA form that says who can have access to their information and who the doctor can talk to. Mm -hmm. You can encourage your child to put you down as a contact person so that if there are any questions, you'd be able to call to talk to that doctor. Okay. You know, and again, that's, you know, personal preference of your child, because at this point, they're an adult and they can say, no, mom, I don't want you to have access to my health information. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think where else I was going with this. Um, Insurance information, make sure they understand that they have to have their insurance card when they go to the healthcare provider. Um, I would recommend looking up who's in network where your child goes to school and making yeah. sure if you have out of network benefits, like how that, if there's nobody in network, how that covers. Um, I know when I was a social worker, we'd work with a lot of patients that would come home to do their health care unless it was an emergency to stick with their in-network benefits. So, so it, like calling the back of your insurance card and asking them to look up who's in network is always a good thing to do. Um, yeah, a lot of times the insurance company will have a website that you can look up who the providers are at certain locations. Another thing you want to look at is the... Um, healthcare provider that's associated with the school health services. Because I know that's something we ran into with my son when he was in college was he saw the, he saw the doctor that was associated with the school. Yes, yeah. and they tend to have both, oh, they have insurance options and they have, um, you know, big schools usually have on campus right. healthcare providers. So understanding whether you can just go there and get the medical care you need is, is important. So we can investigate that, but I, yeah. I do appreciate your insights. They're very helpful. You asked some really good questions, important yeah. questions. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I wanted to ask uh, Diane, I am recording this session mm -hmm. and would, do you mind that your, the Q and A section is part of the video or did you want us to cut it out? Oh, I'm fine with it. I haven't revealed anything to Okay, <laughs> some, some 
patrons are, you know, so. Okay. I get it, I get it. It's very, very good to ask about people's privacy and yes. you know, maybe somebody else will benefit from the answers to those kinds of questions. I agree, I agree. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the insights and uh, thank you to the library for hosting this. And I hope more thank people will watch it on the website uh, when it goes up. Thank you. Well, thank you for attending. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.